My name is Jeff Wilson. By day, I invest in tech companies. And at night, I invest in sports cards. Join me on my journey to profit from the hobby we all love. Hello, sports card investors. I'm Jeff Wilson. Thanks for joining for another episode. As you can tell, I'm still overseas here. I'm about to head back to the States, uh, but I'm still in London, England. And congratulations to those of you who got it right when you watched my last episode and figured out that I am actually overseas for a Jimmy Buffett concert. Yes, that is true. There are very few people who are crazy enough to fly from the United States to Ireland and then on to England to go see Jimmy Buffett tour, but I am one of those few crazy people and pretty pretty proud and happy of that actually. I've had a great time out here, it's been a great trip. But I wanted to make sure to be able to get episodes out to you twice a week as I promised, so I actually pre-recorded uh, most of today's episode, uh, before I left, it's a good conversation about what makes sports cards go up in value. And I hope you get some good takeaways from the conversation today. But before I get into that conversation, I wanted to respond to some feedback that I got on the last episode. So as you may have seen a few days ago, I published an episode called The Death of Prism Silver? Question mark. Um, and during the episode, I talked about the fact that Prism Silver's print runs have been going up and up every year. We expect them to continue to go up and up this year. And this is specifically the, well, it's Prism overall, but the silver uh, refractors within Prism, which are very popular cards for people collecting basketball in particular. Um, and so I speculated that I thought it was better to start looking towards serial numbered cards because we know that the serial number cards obviously have uh, limited print runs because they're serial number to a certain number. And I felt that it was better to look towards serial numbered cards than prism silver cards because I felt like right now the serial numbered cards actually offer better value if you compare the value of those cards to the prism silver cards. So. I absolutely still think that's the case. And I 100% I believe that message that I put out last week. I think it's an important message to put out. But I got some folks writing in and, and taking issue with different parts of the episode. First of all, I appreciate all the feedback. So if even if you have feedback to share, if you disagree with something that I say during these episodes, please let me know. I'm more than happy to take feedback, whether it is a positive feedback or Constructive feedback, totally happy to take that feedback. I had people reach out on my Discord channel, which by the way is a great place for conversations like this. If you've not joined the free Discord chat server yet, please do so. Um, haven't had a lot of this type of discussion in the Facebook group yet, although we've got a lot of people in the Facebook group and discussion is really starting to build there. So the Facebook group is another good place to go if you wanna talk about episodes and you wanna leave feedback based upon what you heard and start and start conversations there. So a couple of the key things that people wrote in that they took issue with. One is, is Prism Silver really a key card? Is it is it a card that you actually should have ever really been worried about from an investment standpoint? Uh, the point that they were making, it's a very fair point, is that if you're really a high-end investor, you wanna be going after the most rare the most scarce, the most high-end card you can possibly find for a player. Because those cards are gonna appreciate more quickly than a card that has a wide print run like a Prism Silver, which may not hold a ton of value over time. That is true, right? So like, for example, if you're into football or basketball, National Treasures, RPAs are, are huge cards. People, you know, everyone wants to go after the National Treasures RPAs. I own a lot of National Treasures RPAs. I would absolutely recommend that if you can afford it within your discretionary budget and you want to spend that type of money on sports cards from an investment standpoint, going after a National Treasures RPA of a football or basketball player is certainly a, uh, a better investment than Prism Silver. Likewise, um, on the baseball front, I would think, and, and this is also true in football and basketball, thinking of, think about low numbered parallel refractors. So obviously in baseball, your super fractor from a Bowman Chrome or Topps Chrome is you know super, super sought after as like a really, really key, incredibly expensive, but awesome card. But then there's also variations that are numbered to 10 or numbered to 25 that are, are really, really sought after as well. And the same holds true for basketball 
where you have like, for example, the prism gold, which is serial number to 10, and those are very sought after. Those are certainly going to be better investment cards for you than prism silver, but they're also tremendously more expensive. So I focused the episode last time on prism silver because prism silver has become a very popular card for investors and particularly newer investors in the hobby. People who have come in in the last few years and are getting their feet wet, prism silver and basketball is, is a really important card. Um, and you know, I think it's for a couple of reasons. First of all, because there's, there is a lot of quantity of them available, which means that they're easy to buy and they're easy to sell and it's easy to know what a fair price is. So people do like them from that angle. Whereas if you're buying a card that's numbered to 10 or something like that, it's sometimes it's often a little bit hard. Well, it's harder to find them in general. Um, and then it's harder to find recent sale price date and everything like that. And of course, uh, you know, Prism Silver is just is more accessible to most people, right? From a price point perspective, if you want to make a nice purchase of a card, you can get in there and get a Prism Silver card where, I mean, you know, RPAs from National Treasures are thousands and thousands of dollars, if not more for some of the real key, you know, players, you're talking tens of thousands of dollars. So, um, you know, I, I still think Prism Silver is a really, really important part of the hobby from an investment standpoint. I do think it's very important. That's why I chose to use it in the episode. But yes, if you're investing for really, really high end, then you're going to want to look beyond Prism Silver uh, for that type of investment. Um, another thing that people said is, well, Prism Silver really hasn't been popular for very long. It's only been popular for the last few years. Prism Silver really only started to catch on in popularity in 2016. So it wasn't really a key card before that. That's that's that is also true. That is also true. Um in fact Prism as a set hasn't existed for, you know, for tremendously long, right? Um but but a lot of my episodes, a lot of what I'm focusing on is who's hot now, who should you be buying now, modern cards from recent years, guys who are rookies, first year, second year, third year. And if you're looking in that window, Prism Silver is certainly a key card. If you're looking for older players, then uh, certainly, you know, there's other types of card varieties. Of course, you had a period of time not too long ago when you had other card manufacturers like Upper Deck and Tops who were producing basketball, uh, you know, and football cards as well. So you had you had a variety in manufacturers. But recent years, um, Prism Silver is is uh, certainly a key card. Um, some people felt that the way that I did the print run calculation was not tremendously accurate. That it was it was done too quickly. Hey. Granted, there are better print run calculations. Some people have pointed them out to me. Some people have spent, some people have spent many, many, many days uh, with a tremendous amount of detail doing print run calculations of silver prisms. Uh, one guy pointed me to the website sportscardanalytics.com, where the author of that website spends a lot of time trying to decode prism, you know, silver prism print runs. Were my print runs, were my calculations the most accurate? Probably not. But my point remains the same, regardless of whether you know, you agree with my print run calculation or not, it is undisputable that Panini has been producing more and more silver prisms every year. And that count has been jumping and jumping and jumping and jumping considerably by like a multiple the last few years. Uh, it has been going up and up. That is an absolute fact. No matter whose print run calculation you look at, the same fact there holds true that it's jumping up and up year after year, which, which makes my original point still very valid which is that prism silvers may not hold their value forever. They may not be that great, you know, car, that key car to get because of the fact that every year the print runs going up and up and up. So if we get to a point in the future where demand starts to wane, you're going to have so much supply of prism silver that it's not going to be as key of a card for you anymore. And that's why I felt like looking at serial numbered cards is a better way to go. So, Final question, should people, should you be looking at Silver Prism at all right now? And just to clarify my stance on that, if you are buying guys from the last few years, I think buying Silver Prism is okay right now, but I think it's probably okay just for the next couple of years. I think there will become a point in time when the hobby starts to cool off and demand starts to wane and Silver Prism becomes devalued. I don't think that's going to happen for the next few years because there's so many new people flooding into the hobby that demand is going up and up and people perceive Silver Prism in basketball as a very important card to be getting. So I think that demand for that card will continue to remain high for the next few years. So I am fine with people going out and buying and investing in Silver Prism 
today. But I would suggest that if you're going to do that, you may want to sell those cards within the next couple of years before the hobby starts to cool off. If you're looking at buying a card and holding on to that card for a long period of time, I think you are better off buying a more rare card like a National Treasures RPA or let's say a Prism Gold, which is serial number to 10. So those are a few follow-up thoughts in the last episode. Again, I love all of the feedback that I got. I appreciate it. Keep it coming. Hit me up on Discord. Hit me up on my Facebook group. But now let's turn our attention to today's episode. Today's episode is about what makes a player's cards go up in value. And to do this episode with me, I invited a guest in, a very special guest, a guy named Joe Davis. He is the owner of one of the largest online card shops in the United States. Uh, his, his website URL is gotbaseballcards.com. He has about a million cards in inventory. Gotbaseballcards.com on his website, on eBay. He's got about a million cards in inventory. He happens to be based in Atlanta, Georgia, which is where I am. He has a wonderful local card shop in Atlanta, Georgia, with a huge warehouse, giant warehouse, where he stores all of these cards. He's got a huge staff. Super knowledgeable guy. His card shop has been open since the early 90s. So this guy has been through the through it all and he collected for many years before that. So him and I sit down here to talk about what makes cards go up in value. Enjoy the conversation. All right, so we're here again with Joe Davis, uh, the owner of Topps Retail Store of the Year this year. Yeah. Uh, huge operation, been in the business for, for many, many years. And so we have an interesting topic to discuss today, and that is what makes players' cards trend, right? So we've got an investor audience here who's looking to know who the next hot thing is so they can get on their cards early. And it's interesting looking back over time, and of course you've seen a lot of this being in the hobby now for almost 30 years, certain players who perhaps should trend don't always trend. And what is it that makes a player trend or not trend? Right. Um, yeah, there's a lot of factors. Um, I think of, uh, I guess one of the first things I look for is where do they play? Yeah. Because, you know, if you've got a stud player who is on a team that never performs, think of Dale Murphy, you know, he was a great player, two-time MVP, but the Braves were really bad back then. Yep. You know, yep. um, but then you've got Acuna now with the Braves sure. on a, a team that we, we here in Atlanta expect to be a playoff team for years to come. Uh, he's playing well, and it's early in his career. So there's a lot of factors. You, uh, I, I often talk about the Tim Raines effect. Tim Raines, great hitter, you know, with all-time stolen base leaders. Yeah, great statistically. Analytics would tell you that yes. guy was off uh, the chart amazing, right? Yeah, Hall of Famer. Yeah. But he played yeah. most of his career in Canada. Yeah. Never got any attention. Yeah. And, you know, his rookie card you can still buy for $10. Yeah. You know, I think we're seeing that in basketball a little bit today with Carl Anthony Towns. Right. Um, you know, he statistically, I like to look at the analytics and yeah. look at what the analytics say about different players. And so I spent a lot of time looking at basketball analytics. Analytics wise, Carl Anthony Towns is one of the very best players in the NBA today. Mm -hmm. The analytics love the guy. Right. But the guy's card prices are lagging way behind yeah. uh, some of his, some of the other players from that year and other years that really are not as talented as him. But he's in Minnesota. And not only is he in Minnesota, but he just signed on recently for, I think, another five years. Yeah, he's going to be there. Yeah, and that's, and that's mm -hmm. the issue. You know, I think with, with the NBA this year, we saw a lot of price movement in the offseason. Uh, with guys switching teams and going to bigger markets. And I actually, one thing I really like about the NBA and investing in basketball cards is you have more of an ability for guys to switch teams and get to bigger markets. It's kind of more of the mindset in the mm -hmm. NBA now to create these super teams. And super teams are really good for card prices. Yes, they are. Um, but, uh, but with someone like Carl Anthony Towns, he's the, uh, you know, the exception that he's committed to a small market. Right. Um, baseball... Uh, you know, we were just talking a little bit about baseball. The mobility of baseball players, I think, is a little bit less. And I think the same with football, right? right. We don't see as much movement. You see some. You get right. sometimes the big free agents. Yeah. But basketball, you see it all the time. In basketball, you see it all the time. Yeah. Um, and I think that type of mobility generally helps. Because even if you've got a guy, like I look at Bradley Beal right now, I think Bradley Beal is a great investment from a basketball card standpoint. Because you've got a guy in a smaller market in Washington. They're not... They're, they're not doing great. They're not making deep playoff runs. But that guy's super talented, and he will be out of Washington, I think, within the next year or two. His contract right. expires yeah. not more, at the end of this year, likely. but at the end of the next year. They may trade him 
before his contract expires. And so if he gets to a big market, that could be that moment that he sees his cards go up immediately, just like we saw with Anthony Davis uh, this offseason. The moment he got traded to L.A., his card prices went up 250%. Yeah. Uh, his rookie cards did. Um, but, you know, in baseball, I guess that's a little bit less less likely to happen. You have a guy like Tim Range you were just talking about, or Dale Murphy. They were with one club for most or all of their careers, right? And and if they get trapped with that club that's not that's not taking off, uh, you know, they're not making playoff runs, you know, typically. Although, you know, it's interesting. Talk to me then, though, about Mike Trout, because don't we have that going on to a degree with Mike Trout? Well, you, he is in L.A. I mean, I mean, that's I mean true. He's, you know, he is in a, in a market that, that's that gets plenty of attention. Uh, and he has kind of bucked the traditional trend, because you're right, he's, he's not on a team that you expect to be. Right. He hasn't been in the playoffs, and, you know, but he, I mean, for whatever reason, there are those exceptions. Everybody calls Mike Trout the modern-day Mickey Mantle. Yeah. You know, he's he's great personality, good character, always performs year after year after year. And uh, sometimes a guy just catches on, and everybody goes, yeah, I really like that guy, too. And it just snowballs. And, right. And uh, so uh, it, it doesn't always make sense, you know, with you know, some, some players it doesn't make sense. So, so you just touched on something there. So we talked a little bit about the market of players in making a difference right. in terms of investability into their car. Yeah. So I think if you're going to invest in a guy, you need to consider what market he's in today, as well as what you know, when could he potentially switch markets if ever, right? right. And that's, so that's a factor. But then you just talked about the players who kind of catch on, players who people look at, even though they're in a small market, they have a something to them that causes them to get that media attention and, and kind of that focus. What is that? What is that? Like, what is that it factor? Or what is it that causes a player, even from a small team, to, to be able to catch on in terms of people really wanting to collect or invest in the guy? Well, sometimes it's the flash appeal. Yeah. And, and, I'll, and I'll start with the reverse. You take Tim Duncan. Yeah. Many consider one of the ten greatest yeah. players ever, yeah. five-time NBA champion, you know, no character issues, just great player. Mol I don't know how many years all-star, but um, his cards aren't worth hardly anything. Yeah. Relative to Isn't that amazing? He just, you know. He's about to go just, in the Hall of Fame, right? Oh, I think yeah, this yeah. is this. Now, it'll be interesting, actually, I'm going to do another episode on – does going into, if you're about to go in the Hall of Fame, do you get a bump from that? I'm going to go back and analyze that several years back. It'll be interesting to look at that. So maybe he'll see a little bit of a bump in the year ahead. But you're right. I mean, historically, his prices have been way below what his performance would suggest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so the opposite is sometimes you'll have players, like you can look historically over some Yankee players who right. are always you know, uh, who were in the playoffs over and over. They might not have necessarily performed that well, but they were with a team that was constantly mm -hmm. in the limelight. Uh, I mean, I remember back in the day, this is a strength, when, when the Braves first got hot in the 90s, we sold Mark Lemke cards left and right. <laughs> now, he wasn't exactly a great investment, mm -hmm. but he was a great seller for us because he was on a team that was in the playoffs yep. consistently and he was a likable character. Yep. So, so sometimes it's not just how they perform, it's their personality. Do they play to the camera or yeah. do they not? You know, and uh, you know, like Greg Maddox stuff is incredibly undervalued. You know, he was not a big flashy guy, yep. a consistent winner wherever he went, but in great numbers, Hall mm -hmm. of Famer. But his rookie cards really aren't worth that much. Yeah, you know, yeah, not, yeah. Not Qu quiet, quiet guy. Yeah. Even though statistically yeah. one of the better pitchers of all time, mm -hmm. um, you know, but a quiet guy. I. It, uh, you, and you had other guys on those Braves teams like John Smoltz, who was a little bit more out there in right. terms of personality, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, and you know that probably helped them. You know, I think in in uh, in football this past year, you know, we saw that with Baker Mayfield. You know, exactly. I mean, his performance was good, yes, but he definitely like his card prices went above and beyond his performance in part because he's such a big personality figure. And he is he's showy, right? He's a little bit arrogant. He's a little bit showy, but people like swagger to a degree now right. and Antonio Brown it may be a, yeah, a little over the overboard yeah swagger. <laughs> and so it's interesting it's like you got to have like if you're rating players on a range of like conservative and uh you know uh stays out of the limelight uh that's probably bad from a sports card investment standpoint right. then all the way to the other extreme where you got your diva wide receiver who's over the top and Antonio Brown that probably starts to become bad it turns but, people off but I think yeah. you're I think you need to go towards that direction yeah. in most cases right, right? You, um, you, you know, and, and so you've got to have a little bit of that. And that's going to be interesting. You know, um, 
so obviously right now in basketball, your your hottest guy coming into this year is Zion. Right. What's interesting about Zion is from a, I haven't seen a ton of personality from him from like a like kind of a swagger standpoint, but his game has so much personality. Yes, He's such an unusual figure to look at. Such flair. Right? I mean, yeah. He's got such flair in his mm -hmm. game that it's almost like he doesn't personally have to be pumping for the cameras. In fact, I think he's pretty, you know, from what I've seen, he's kind of a, a nice, you know, humble guy. Right, right. But he doesn't need to be pumping for the cameras because his game is so, you know, dominant because of his physical nature. Right, right. Um, and I think that's another factor, oh, yeah. right? Like the physical nature of a guy. Like, yeah. and I think that's, you know, um, being drawn over time to a Jose Canseco or a Bo Jackson or Herschel Walker. Granted, all of their on-field results were awesome too. Right. But the very physical nature of those guys, I mean, I remember the Bo Jackson card uh, you know, the bow card that came out mm -hmm. in score in the yep. early 90s where he's Still just popular, flexing and holding a right. bat and, you know, just looking like this, like, specimen. Uh, and, that, yeah, super popular card, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah bow was a great – and I mean, even Dion, we saw that in Atlanta. You know, yeah. Two-sport athlete. Dion. Big deal. It's yeah. a big deal. It's a shame yeah. we don't really have those anymore. Right. You know, it, I mean, wouldn't – actually, wouldn't that be great for the – for from an investing standpoint for the industry – if we had, you know, two sport yeah. athletes today, like right. what would that, if Kyler Murray uh, were to actually pursue both football and baseball, right. which he could, he could, you know, theory. but yeah. it's the sports obviously have become more specialized and they don't, they don't really want that to happen yeah. anymore, yeah. especially he's a quarterback and that would make right. it particularly difficult. Yeah. They don't want him to tear an ACL running the base path yeah. or something, whatever. But. but man, that would be good from an investment standpoint. Right? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Maybe would. someone will do it again. That's the right. first guy who does it, you know, again, and sets that trend again, we'll probably see his card prices take off like wild, yeah. take off overnight. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, I think, so we talked a little bit about what team you're with, what market you're with. Um, I think, and you, you touched on this a little bit with the Yankees. I think being in the playoffs yeah. makes a really big difference. And, you know, I like to look at, uh, at the beginning of a season, I like to look at Vegas odds that project out what teams are going to be in the playoffs, you know, have the best chance of, you know, making the championship and looking at teams that, you know, maybe in past years haven't been there, but now are expected to be there. And so those guys will be coming really into the spotlight, you know, more than they have been in the spotlight before. I think that's kind of an interesting way of looking at things, because as you said, with the Yankees, perpetually being in that spotlight is going to drive your card prices, even if, you're actually maybe not even that great of a player. Yeah, I mean, uh, thinking about this year coming up, yep. one guy that I think was Cody Bellinger. Yeah, absolutely. You know, he's still young. He was, you know, great rookie. In yep. 2017, he was super hot. He's got, what, four, at, at this time, at 44 home runs yep. in mid-September on a playoff team. Looks like Dodgers will you know, have a good shot to be a playoff contention team for yep. years to come. He's one that's a good investment. Yep. Uh, when you talk about... Uh, uh, home run hitters with, uh, think of it, you know, Alonzo yep. this year. Yep. I mean, a rookie who's yep. leading the yep. majors in home runs, and yep. he's in a major media. He's got a lot going for yep. him. You know, he's in New York, and so you know, he, yeah. he's another one. Got a lot, lot going for him. I've had some people ask me, can Acuna's card prices go up any higher this year? Like, is it possible? Are they already maxed out? Is it possible for them to go higher? And my response, my response has been. The Braves have got a shot. They got a real shot in the playoffs. And if they have a deep playoff run, and if he performs well in the playoffs, his cards are going to go up and up. Uh, so you know, I think I think whether you buy Acuna right now before the playoffs start, in my opinion, comes down to how well do you think the Braves are going to do in the playoffs? How well do you think he's going to do in the playoffs? If you think the Braves are not going to go deep, then maybe you're better off waiting until the off season to buy. Yeah. Whereas if you do think the Braves are going to go deep, then buy now because you'll see them rise. You know, over the course of the playoff run. Yeah, I mean. Uh this year at the National, I went there with the intention of buying up a bunch of Acuna stuff. Right. And it was crazy. I had more and more people, not from Atlanta, asking, what did we have on him to sell? Yeah. They're like, hey, we see you from Atlanta. Yeah. We're chasing his cards. Yeah. Um, he is being treated as the next Mike Trout. Yeah. As yeah. far as with, with baseball card investors. Yeah. And he's you an know? interesting guy because he's got a little bit of a different look. He's got a little bit, you can see some of his personality out yes. on the field a yeah. little bit more. Uh -huh. He wears his emotions on his sleeve a little bit yeah. more than some of the guys do. And I think that makes him stand out a bit in baseball and, and makes him, you know, kind of a noticeable figure, which I like right. from an investment standpoint. And the fact that he's a hitter and, I mean, he's, yes. he's approaching 40 40 as we record this. Yeah. Be the, could be the fifth player to ever do it. Yeah. You know, and, and the youngest to ever do yeah. it. That, that's, some serious talent yeah. and you can pull that off at that age. So let's talk about let's talk about that because 
there are, I also think, certain statistical categories or certain types of players that are likely going to command more attention. So I think in baseball, the home run hitters. I mean, I remember obviously Aaron Judge and how crazy that was a couple of mm-hmm. years ago yeah. when he as a rookie was was tearing it up. And it's a lot like what we're seeing this year from Pete Alonso, exactly. right? Yeah. Um, and so the home run, I think, I think your big home run hitters in baseball tend to garner more attention and see yeah. card prices appreciate Definitely. than maybe somebody who's a utility player, even even a great one or someone who's great in the field, right? Someone right. who's, and, and, and they hit for average, but they don't hit for power. Right, um, exactly, yeah. Yeah, home run is the number one metric. Yeah. For, for card collecting, I mean, for baseball card collecting. Yeah. Do they hit home runs? Yeah. You know, do they drive runs in? You know, and then average after that. But And people who have all three going for I mean, the year Miguel Cabrera got triple crown, he was smoking hot. His cards were so hot. And so um, that is definitely the number one thing people, ch- you, know, you know, when Judge had, what, 52, I'm like, his rookie year was huge. Uh, I still remember the, the, the home run chase of 98, uh, when, you know, McGuire and Sosa, when they were both chasing Roger Maris's record. The, the prices we saw their cards reach was just meteoric that year. I mean, it was yep. a crazy rise of value of their cards, all about home runs. Uh, Barry Bonds stuff, very strong before the steroid stuff hit. You know his stuff was very strong when he got you know chased when he was chasing Aaron's all-time yep. record and yep. single-season record. So, so that's an interesting point. So if you're prospecting, if you're looking for baseball prospects, maybe slanting your search towards guys with power, exactly. guys with the guys who you think could potentially get into the league at some point and you know hit for a number of home right. runs a year. Yeah, well, I look for that balance. Look for power and average. Because if the guy's only batting 200 in double A, mm-hmm. even if he's killing the ball, he's probably never going to make it up. Yeah, that's true. So, you know, you're, you're looking for a guy who's at least hitting 260, 270, yeah. you know, with power. You yeah. Know, and so it, it, it needs to be a combination. But, yeah, the people who are putting up the big numbers have the best shot to for their cards to spike later. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, very interesting. So let's see, what would be the equivalent of that in uh, – so in basketball, I think your equivalent of that is probably your three-point shooter. Or, or just your, um, it's a mix of that. It, it's for, for basketball, to me, I look at the ball handlers. Yeah. The guys that, that's why even though like Ben Simmons is not a great three-point shooter, right. or he's a non-existent three-point shooter at this point, right. but he gets a lot of attention. He handles the ball all the time. He does. And he's on a team that will probably be in the playoffs for a long yeah. time. I mean, I think, I think Simmons will have a title eventually. I think Giannis will have a title eventually. You know, I think Kawhi's got a good shot at another title. Kawhi's not one of those quiet guys. Thankfully, he left Toronto to go to L.A., yep. or at least he's in a media city. Yep. But um, you know, Kawhi's a great all-around player. The cards still mm-hmm. aren't real expensive. Uh, but, yeah, in NBA, three-point shooters, uh, Curry. Yeah, I mean, people Curry, love Steph Curry, Curry right? And Steph, people love Steph yes. Curry, and, and, you know, he's got some personality, too, but obviously just an amazing shooter from anywhere on the court. I think uh, it's why there's a lot of hype right now around Trey Young. I mean yes. the fact that the guy can pull shots back from way behind the three point line and people are people are, are drawn to that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. and and another young team with, mm-hmm. with future potential, you know, to improve. So the Hawks and, and so this kind of ties into some of the things we've been talking about today. From a basketball card investing standpoint, right. I like a lot of the players on the Hawks right now. Yep. You know, the Hawks have a really gun, good nucleus of young guys and I don't know that. I first of all, I do think there's the. I do think Atlanta has the chance if they can keep these guys together, to be a really uh, prime team in the NBA in a mm-hmm. few years. Right? right, it's going to take a few three, years of development, years. three yeah. to five years. Right, um, so that could happen, and then that could raise the guys' prices with it as they are getting into the playoffs. Or Atlanta could not keep them together, and we could see guys like John Collins, uh, you know, jump to another market in a couple of years, yeah. um, you know, Trey Young could jump, et cetera. Right. And, and that's okay, I mean, from, I, I would hate that as a Hawks fan, oh, yeah. but from an investing standpoint, that's okay too. Sure. Because, it, you know, a guy like John Collins, who's definitely an up and coming guy, I'm buying a lot of his cards, uh, he just needs to get to a contender. Whether yeah. that contender is the Hawks and they become that, or whether that contender is another team in a bigger market, right. and then he's gonna see his cards go up in value. Right, Yeah. I agree. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Okay, and then so, what about football? I mean, football is so quarterback driven, driven. Yeah. yeah. And it's really, I think the, um, I think kind of the flashy guys in football right now from the quarterback standpoint, are, are the guys who can run and pass. I mean, I think you've seen, obviously, you know, Lamar Jackson's really catching, uh, on. Uh, catching on right yes. now, off to a hot start. 
Um, you know, you've got uh, Deshaun Watson, um, who uh, is, uh, you know, similarly kind of, you know, pretty popular right. card to buy right now. Yeah. Uh, and of course, it doesn't have to just be that. I mean, you obviously, you got your more traditional passers like your Breeze and your Brady and your right. Roethlisberger and that yeah. kind of thing. You got to win, too. Well. You got to win. You can't just be flashy. That's yeah, true. Yeah, that's win. true. And that's that's R- one. Ring, rings add up. <laughs> Ring, rings one concern I have about like a guy like Kyler Murray is just the, the Cardinals are a ways away. Yeah. But on the flip side, on the flip side, if he can take the Cardinals from being a two-win team to being a seven-win team, you know, that's exactly, by the way, what Baker Mayfield did last right, year. Right. And the Browns only got to what I think seven wins, but that was good enough. And people saw the, you know, they saw Baker as the guy who came in in the middle of the year and carried them to several victories right. and carried them to become this better team. Right. And so it's almost, it doesn't even necessarily in all cases have to be the playoffs. It's the momentum of the team and what the expectations were versus how that team is trending. Yeah. And then, you know, investors will look at the, okay, so this quarterback is taking this team from here to here. Now's the time to get on him in case eventually he can take him from here to here. Yeah. 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 And uh, you're right when you say just talk about the quarterbacks in general, because in general, football card collectors, quarterbacks, running backs, yeah. wide receivers. Yeah. Once you get past that, it's rare you ever even see a tight end catch yeah. on. It's set definitely, other than TJ, you just don't, I mean, JJ Watt, yeah. excuse me, you don't see football defensive players, players, defensive yeah. players catch on. Yeah, yeah. So it's, uh, so yeah, you, you're, if you're, if you're investing in a single player, yeah. go after the, the high profile quarterback, at least on a semi competitive team who, I mean, Sam Darnold stuff's hot right now. Sam I mean, Darnold stuff is hot. This off season, his stuff went up and up yes. and up. And I'm, I, I, it's going to be interesting to see how the next few weeks unfold for him because he, uh, you know, started the season with a disappointing loss, yeah. and then now he's out with mono and is going to miss, you know, potentially multiple games. He had he he was supposed to have a big showdown with Baker Mayfield, but that didn't happen because yeah. he was out with mono. Right. And so, you know, is the shine going to start to wear from him a little bit? You know, kind of quickly. I also, by the way, haven't seen. I haven't watched a ton of Sam Darnold, but I haven't seen a ton of personality from him, at least I mean, certainly compared to like a Baker or right, somewhere like right. that. You don't have nearly the same you yeah. know, personality. Yeah. So I don't know. He does have the media market going for him. He's got the media market. And he had good stats to finish the yeah, year last he year. Did. So if he can he continue did. that. So. And that is true. If the Jets get hot at any point in time, which I don't think that's going to necessarily happen this year, but perhaps future years, um, he will really benefit from the spotlight of being in a big city. Um, and that's another great point, right? The media market. We haven't talked a ton about the media market, but the guys in LA, the guys in New York, the guys in uh, Chicago, you know, they're naturally going to, to get some advantage in terms of spotlight just by being in one of the larger cities. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we saw it with Anthony Davis going from a New Orleans. Oh, yeah. Immediate to an LA. Value. Immediate I mean, I saw value. the same thing with uh, Giancarlo Stanton. Yeah. He went to the Yankee. I mean, immediately his stuff. It was yeah. like he had just hit 50 some home runs, but his cards Marlins, took off right. more right. after he went to the Yankees. Yeah, so I mean, that's, you know, I think another investment strategy is to be very aware of players' contract statuses yes. and to know when guys are going to be potentially shifting. I, I, and you saw it this year, obviously, in the NBA in the offseason mm-hmm. with an incredible amount of shifting of uh, players. More than I've ever seen. Yeah, yeah. It's, it was yeah. wild. Now, looking at the free agent class next year in the NBA, it's very soft. Correct. It's like it's yeah, it's very soft. Little movement right? will matter because I mean it's the, there's not many guys who are going to be moving that matter. Right, to the collectors. Yeah. But if from it from an investment standpoint, if you had early this year, uh, had you know been aware of all of the guys who could be moving a free agency over the summer, and bought into their cards back early in the year, you would have seen some really great gains. It highlighted I mentioned them a few times, but Anthony Davis, who by the way everybody knew. That Anthony Davis was going to, you know, leave New Orleans and get oh, traded yeah. somewhere, somewhere in the offseason. He was going to go somewhere, and chances were he was going to go to a big market. Chances were he was going to go maybe to New York or right. LA, obviously where he ended up. Yep. And yet, yet the second the news announced, which was really not a big surprise to anybody, no. his no. cards went up two hundred fifty percent. You know, so I mean, yeah. if you savvy investors should have been on that back Ahead in March, in April, when his guards were down, knowing what's about to come that yeah. summer. And yeah. so I think being aware of contract status in, in all sports, right. and when guys might move, and, and getting and ahead where they of might that, go. and where they might go. Yes. And that's important too, right? Yeah. Where they might go. Absolutely. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Well, this has been a good discussion, Joe. Anything else on this front you want to add? Uh, no, like I so said, just you know, focus on you know, the markets people are in, 
focus on the high performers, yep. focus on the high profile. You know, because you can be a you great wide receiver, but you're still not going to get that much attention. Right. You know, I mean, Odell for a while yeah. was an exception. Yeah. And now he's in Cleveland. And, you know, you can yeah. get hot again. Yep. But in general, you want to focus on your scorers in the NBA. You want to focus on your home run hitters in baseball. You want to focus on your quarterbacks in football. Yeah, you know? absolutely. And so when you're looking for prospects and young guys, rookies, be thinking in those areas for sure. Exactly. Good. Awesome, yeah. Joe. It's great to great to chat with you again. All right. Enjoyed Appreciate it. all the insights. No Thank problem. you. Thanks. Hey guys, thanks for watching my conversation with Joe Davis. I hope you enjoyed it. Let me know what you think. Let me know, did we miss anything? Was there anything that does make players' cards go in value that we didn't talk about? What are your thoughts? Let me know by joining our Facebook group or our Discord chat server. The link for both of those are in the show notes. So just expand the description of the show on YouTube and you'll see the links there. Or on podcasts, go in and look at the detailed description. You'll see the links there. Uh, so we can get you into those groups totally free to join. Would love to get your feedback on today's show. Check out Joe's website, gotbaseballcards.com. As I mentioned before, he's got about a million cards in inventory between his website and his eBay store. Got baseball cards, great guy to, uh, to, to do business with, really honest, upstanding guy. Hope you guys enjoyed the episode, and I look forward to being back in my studio and seeing you guys on Sunday for our next episode. Have a great day.